Welcome to the Agent Upgrade Podcast with your hosts, Jasmine Cronedan and Alan Corey, where we learn the strategies of top producing real estate agents so you have the tools to upgrade your own real estate career. All right, guys, another week, another episode of the Agent Upgrade Podcast. And uh, this is a fun one. We got special guests filling in uh, for Jasmine, Jeff Goddard. Also a member of Jasmine Mortgage Team, also Jasmine's husband, former real estate agent, turned to the mortgage side, and Went you have inside side. both sides. Yeah. I was about to say it, call it the dark side, and then I'm like, it's not the dark side. They're a necessary partner to necessary every real estate. Like, you need, yeah. Yeah, it, it's not evil. It, it, it's, it's good. And, uh, you know, I, I bill uh, mortgage lenders as people who... Um, like if they approve your loan, like they're they're the stodgiest, most conservative partner you can have in any purchase and any sort of investment. And if they're like, yeah, you can afford the loan, uh, and we'll give you the money for it, and we'll give it to you for cheap, then then you know yeah. that, that you should buy the house. Not always that case. Obviously, the laws changed after two thousand eight, two thousand nine, so that you guys are a little bit more stricter, and not everyone can just get a loan for having to impulse. So I, I think we're in a good place with mortgage lenders. Um, not yeah, a necessary. So too. It's yeah. amazing what a decade of actual good underwriting does for the housing market. Yeah, 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 totally. Like uh, you know, that's why like I'm not concerned if housing prices go down. There's an economic downturn. There's not going to be a wave of foreclosures because everyone who's bought a house is locked in in a super low rate. Definitely got underwritten uh, to to the gills, uh, yeah. and uh, they can afford it. We know that they can afford it. So yeah, and if they do whatever, have a situation where they have to sell, they're not underwater most likely because you've had such a rapid increase uh, yeah. for the last three, five, <laughs> ten years. So even if there is a little bit of downturn, there's still a lot of meat on that bone. Yeah, somebody loses their job and they can't get it back and they can't make the payment, they can sell. Now that's That only gets really hard when you're underwater on your value and you don't have any yeah. jobs. We're not in yeah. that position right now. All righty. Well, so uh, it, it's fun to have you as a co-host. So thank you for filling in. Why Why are you filling in, actually? I should ask you. Well, that. working with your spouse, you get drawn into things like this. She said, we just got nine loan applications that came in. I need you to cover the Agent Upgrade podcast. And of course, <laughs> okay. well, I have to say yes. I'm her spouse. Well, congrats. I mean, I think uh, nine. Uh, that means there's there's nine agents out there uh, getting you know deals under contract. In you know what we're seeing as a slow market, August things slow down. So that's 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 good, and that's yeah. why I want a mortgage lender on the show because we're learning. Like it's not just my experience; it's you're you're dealing with dozens and, and hundreds of agents, and you see a lot of activity. So and it might be slow see, for me. Yeah, what the lender sees as a is a leading indicator for a, how busy agents are going to be, yeah. because we get those loan apps. 30 to six, 30 days to six months prior to your commission check coming in. And so when, when lenders get busy, especially purchase lenders, it's great news for the future of the real estate market. Yeah. 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 If you get the pre pre-qualification letters coming in, you, you know, there's a bunch of buyers, uh, you know, coming in as well. And uh, right. yeah, no, that, 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 that's awesome. Um, cool. Well, Jeff, I'm, you, you, you're co-hosting on a good good one here. Uh, we've got a great author joining us. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with Paul Ross, but uh, he, he wrote the book, the, the, one, one, a, a very entertaining sales book, Subtle Words That sell, sell, How to Get Your Prospects to Convince Themselves to Buy and Add Top Dollars to Your Bottom Line. Um, you know, selling's a big part of our game, both of our games, right? Yeah, it really is. I, and and I, I, I believe that selling to the subconscious mind like there's something there for sure. Like, like that, that's a, if you can do that, if you can pierce the subconscious and you get them sold in the subconscious, well, I would imagine getting them, uh, you know, to say yes, they're conscious to say yes is, is a easier win. Not that we're ever pressuring people to buy homes, but a lot of times people just have that fear of commitment, analysis, paralysis, first time or freeze, whatever you want to call it, where, um, you know, they're making a big decision. And, uh, if you can kind of do the sales pitch, um, or, or maybe you're selling yourself as a real estate agent. You're not just selling the house, but you're selling yourself as a real estate agent. Um, and, or, you know, trying to sell to other agents to you know, return your calls or negotiate with you if there's multiple bidding sort of situation. So, um, I'm, I'm happy to, to kind of dig in here and, and learn how to basically hypnotize you, each other. Yeah. I, I can't wait to hear what Paul has to say. All right. Let's bring him in to the agent upgrade studio. Paul Ross. Thanks for joining us. 
Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be from coast to coast, shore to shore, and all the ships at sea. It is I, Paul Ross, master of subconscious selling, hypnotist, author, entrepreneur, online marketer, healer, and all around great guy and cat lover. Great to be here on the show. And we're going to be dropping bombs of wisdom like it was Vietnam. Well, so, I've got, I've really got excited. ailments I need your help with, with the healing, the healing part. Oh, well, that I, that's a totally separate issue. But yeah, I'm trained in doing, doing NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. As a matter of fact, we interviewed the creator of NLP on my podcast, The Influencer's Edge. Just dropped a little plug for my podcast. But yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I wanted to jump in based on something I heard you guys chatting about while I was in the green room, the backstage room, which is selling yourself and selling homes, et cetera, et cetera. And you talked about uh, per, uh, analysis paralysis. And what did you call first timers what? I call it first timers freeze. Uh, you, like uh, you just, there's just frozen yeah. and, you know, yeah. Yeah. you got different people in the so ears and, and everything. It brings up the first bit of sort of mic dropping I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be doing a lot of it, which is you're never selling real estate. You're never selling mortgage loans. You're not selling yourself or any of that. You're selling decisions and good feelings about decisions. See, the most important part of my book title uh, is how to get your prospects to convince themselves to buy. How do you get them to convince themselves to buy? And that presupposes that can, to convince yourself, you have to make a decision. So anything you can get your prospect to imagine as being their own thought will be perceived by them as being their own and therefore it will not be resisted. If you have to first give them facts, data, figures, information, they may perceive it as coming outside of themselves and therefore they will resist it. So we want to begin to ask ourselves, how can we use communication in a certain way that opens up our prospects to want to receive our message? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm curious to hear how to get there, but I, I do think when people feel like it's their own, their own idea and it's supported by you, that, that, uh, that that's going to carry a lot more weight. The first thing we need to ask ourselves, though, is before we start talking about how can we influence our prospects, we have to ask ourselves, how can we get ourselves in the ideal frame of mind? What's the ideal frame of mind when we set out to do this? Because half of what happens, 50% is how you show up. I can and do teach tools, exact pieces of language to create massive rapport in the first three minutes, go beyond rapport into creating the perception on your prospects part on the unconscious level that they want to follow you and believe you to what you say. This is a border. We really, there's, we really have to adjust perhaps the fears of manipulation here. Yeah, that's all true. That's all powerful. That's important. And the way in which you show up, the way in which you deliver it, your vibe, your beliefs about what you deserve, your beliefs about what you can do. Those are the most important things, the mindset. So with your permission, and only with your permission, I don't want to seem as if I'm taking over the show. I do want to talk a little bit about the right mindset when you're going into this. Well, I, Paul, I think you're more entertaining than us, so run, run, run with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I like to entertain yeah. people as they discover. Yeah. I'm just going to really sit back here on the couch and listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, speaking to you as a podcast host, I do know the best guests are those who require the host to say the least. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Here's what I wanted to point out. So everyone teaches you need to get in rapport with your prospect. Correct. This is something you hear. It's holy writ. It's not questioned. It's yeah, not relationship not building. Yeah, yeah, building conversations. Get Here's them to trust the you. Rapport is extraordinarily dangerous to a sale. Now, you've never heard this before. I'm very contrarian contrarian and disruptive hypnotic salesperson, <laughs> as someone labeled me. I like to be disruptive. Rapport is actually extremely dangerous and you gotta be careful because if you're in deep rapport with your prospect, but you're feeling anxious or nervous, they're gonna feel anxious and nervous, but they, don't, they won't know why. And they'll interpret that as being a danger signal. If you on the unconscious level are feeling fear, anxiety, tension, nervousness, 
and you don't know where it's coming from, you're going to assume there's a danger signal or a signal that you can't trust and you need to get out of there. I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt you. I've watched plenty of Caesar Milan dog training videos and uh, that's what he teaches. So, uh, well, like, good. There you go. Yeah. So you're yeah. right. Yeah, we're, I'm not the Caesar Milan of uh, sales, but he's got his own brand. I love his shows too. They're addictive. Humans are not pack animals the way dogs are. The point being that you need to learn to control your state. Now, what are some of the myths about the right state to get into when you're selling? Well, myth number one is the peak state. You need to get yourself into the peak state. This is the Tony Robbins school of, yes, I can do it. Yes, I'm the best. Walking on hot coals, going 150% energy. This is Annette Benning saying, I'm gonna sell this house today. Now, here's, here's the challenge with this. Number one, peak states are great if you're Tony Robbins and you're in front of an audience of 40,000 people live, you need to be in a peak state. If you're in that peak state and you're coming at your prospect, they're gonna think you're manic. Number one, it's gonna convey the wrong message. It's gonna convey that you're over-interested, that you're too interested, that you're, com that you're over-committed, that you're attached. To learn to be non-attached, to be interested and prepared for your outcome, but process-oriented and non-attached, is an incredibly powerful thing. It's very subtle. It's not the same as a super positive state of, I know I can make this work. It's a different thing. It's saying, you know what? I'm interested in the sale, but I'm invested in my skills. And let's make it better. I'm joyfully invested in my skills. I'm consistently and joyfully invested in my skills. I teach in my Invisible Influence series, I teach the power of using adverbs, as crazy it is, I know it sounds like grammar school, to increase your mindset in a, in a realistically positive way. What's the difference between saying, I commit to using my skills and saying, I joyfully commit to using my skills? What's the difference between that and saying, I joyfully and consistently commit to powerfully using my skills? Yeah, the commitment so these, in, it, in and of itself can sometimes be not something you really want to do. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, to me, it, it, it's your, are you saying like basically they can feel your passion and your confidence and your abilities and that, that sort of. No, this is for you. This is for okay. you. It's one okay. thing, to say, thing to say, I commit to my skills, but commitment, the whole idea of rebellion and pressure. But when you say I joyfully commit, Mm -hmm. It colors the emotional flavor around it. I hope this is not too sophisticated or complex. No, this is interesting because I think uh, commitments can be great, like a commitment to a, a spouse that you love, and some other commitments might keep you from doing what you really want to do. So if I'm joyfully committed, it changes the whole dynamic. Yes. So that's number one, the, the peak. Uh, and the final thing about peak states is they're exhausting. They're just exhausting. You just can't... You, keep it going it's 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 yeah. where you go. So I prefer to get to a state that's neutral, which means you're grounded in your body, that you have the appropriate amount of enthusiasm, that you're there to serve, but also not just serve, you're there to suggest. Service times suggestion equals leadership. And for me, sales, whatever you're selling is primarily about leadership. You've got to lead your prospect into a state of mind where they're really, really eager to believe you and where they can trust themselves. So let me unpack that. The real question you need to ask, having the recognition that you're never selling real estate or loans, you're always selling decisions and good feelings about decisions. You're a decision service technician. If you want to think about it that way, if you will, you're not even a salesperson in that sense. You're a decision service technician. You're there in service People say sales is about service. Well, in service of what? I say you're a decision service technician. You're assisting people in making good decisions. Here is the big problem, the big challenge. We've all heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is another thing that's never challenged. Everyone always says it. You've got to have your prospect know, like, and trust you, correct? 
that's no longer complete. It's not that that's not true. And it's not that all the selling courses you've taken or whatever you're doing is not true. It's just that it's not as powerful anymore. And here's why. You've now got a second task, which is to get your prospect to trust themselves. Prospects no longer trust their ability to make a great decision unless they're very sophisticated investors. That's a different story. Why do they not trust themselves? Well, first and foremost, it's very hard to make a good decision nowadays because they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed and overloaded and distracted. For those who are listening, you can't see it. I'm holding up my iPhone. They're overloaded by this thing. We get so much input, so much input. We have instant messenger. We have texting, God, TikTok, Instagram, Tinder. Not that I know anything about Tinder. Look how handsome I am. I don't need it. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. <laughs> You're <laughs> yeah. yeah. So people are so distracted. I remember when YouTube, the ads were two minutes long. Now, how much time do they give ads before you can click off them on YouTube? Five seconds. I paid five bucks and don't see any of them. 15 yeah. seconds. 15 yeah. seconds. That's it. So your prospects are distracted. Second thing is they have too many options. A confused and overwhelmed mind doesn't make any choices. They have too many options. They're getting too many calls, too many cold calls, too many outreaches. Everyone's saying the same thing to them. Too many choices. If you've ever heard the objection, uh, we have a few more agents we need to talk to or interview. Have you ever heard that? Oh, of course, yep. Yeah. Yeah. What are they really expressing? They're expressing they're confused and, and they're overwhelmed and, and they don't know how to make a good decision because they're overwhelmed with too many options. They don't know how to make a decision to choose you. By the, exactly. By the way, can I drop a free uh, gold nugget and tell you how to destroy that objection? Go ahead. Let's hear it. All right, what would it be worth it to you in terms of your income if you could destroy that objection every time and get them to sign you up as their listing agent uh, right away? Oh, yeah, that would boost it 10, 15%. All right, here we go. This is just proof that my stuff works because I'm so off the wall. Can I swear on your show? Oh, yeah. oh uh, it's encouraged. Uh, I'm so batshit crazy. I've been told, Paul, your stuff is batshit crazy. No one's going to believe it. So, I give away free stuff because I believe your best evidence, your the best evidence that my stuff works is your own results. So go out and try this. So when they say, let's role play, say I got to interview a few more agents. Uh, uh, well, okay, Alan, you're the actual realtor on the show. So he's. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Um, hey, uh, no, I understand. You, uh, I, I think you should. And uh, I think you should uh, ask your realtor. These following questions to make sure that um, no 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 I want most... you to be the prospect and say I've got too oh. many I've got to interview uh, uh, okay. oh okay roll right. uh, Paul thanks for coming over um, my friends warned you, me that you're a batshit crazy and you li you know but no no uh, no no no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know I'm still I'm still I'm still interviewing other agents but you 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 are one of the best and I see your signs everywhere and uh, I, I you know but I still need to talk to two other agents. I hey, I understand completely. Can I ask you a question? No, please. Have yes. you ever been in the circumstance where the more options you were offered and the more the more confusing it became because there was just too much to choose from? Oh, yeah, definitely. definitely. Why don't we take all that confusion and just set it aside and find a way where you can recognize you really can move forward today right now? So thinking about it just like that. What would we have to get on the table or off the table for you to feel comfortable moving ahead today? Now, what am I doing? This is called a counter example. You're saying I need more. I need to see more people. I'm saying I understand, but have you ever been in the circumstance where the more choices we, you were presented with, the harder it became to make a good decision because it just generated too much confusion to think clearly? Yeah, like the cereal aisle. Good grief. Yeah. <laughs> so now what am I doing? I'm taking the very thing they're saying is going to help them avoid pain. I'm saying, no, no, if you do that, it's going to just cause pain. So I'm in effect wiping out the objection. I'm associating the objection on the subconscious level to pain. So the objection has to drop. The brain doesn't like pain. And then I present them a different meaning, a different way to view it. This is one of five techniques that I teach in my Invisible Influence series on crushing objections. 
counterexamples. I learned this when I was a young man trying to date and getting nowhere. I subsequently became a dating coach. That's my side hustle. My side hustle that I stu still do on occasion is I'm a dating and charisma coach for guys who just can't meet women. And but so, so wait, 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 wait. I want to, so, so you're on a date, your first date, and you're like, hey, let me just make this easy for you. <laughs> no, it's no. going to be confusing I'm for you to date other guys. Date. I'm talking <laughs> about just getting, getting to date. I learned this early on, this counterexamples yeah. thing where uh, a woman would say to me, she'd say, um, hey, can I get your number? And I'd say, now, why would I put the work of making sure you get to enjoy my company more on your shoulders? Isn't that my job as a man? And that's a complete pattern. Of, they would laugh, even though they, and later they would say, you know, I had no interest in you whatsoever, but you were so cool. And the way you handled that bull, that bullshit I threw your way, I thought, this guy's different and interesting. I got to give him a first date, it's just a chance. I've got a question for you, Paul. Yeah. So I, I heard uh, a listing agent once say, if you know they're going to interview multiple people, make sure you're the first one they talk to. And his whole thing was, I know you're supposed to talk to these other three people. And I'm sure if you signed up with me right now, that would be a very uncomfortable call to tell them that you are canceling the meeting. But I'll tell you what, I'll make the calls to those three agents. You don't even have to do anything. I like that last part. I wouldn't start with uh, the suggestion that it's uncomfortable. I, I would say, uh, I would not start with a suggestion that it's going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I would say, I know we haven't yet discovered in a, a very comfortable and smooth way to make sure we move forward ahead and, and take care of the fact that these other appointments had been on your schedule. Notice those words, had yeah. been on your schedule, implies what? That they aren't home. anymore. Yeah. Exactly. So the use of words is very powerful. That's why I call the book Subtle Words Itself. I understand that up until this moment, these agents had been on this your schedule. Look at that. Up until this moment, what does that imply? It'll be different after now. Exactly. We imply it. We imply it with that phrase. If I had said, yeah, that's true, but you're going to cancel on them. And to make it easier on you psychologically, I'll do the canceling. What would they do? They flip us the bump. But by implying it, remember what I said, whatever you can get your prospects to perceive as being their own idea, mm -hmm. resistant. Remember the subtitle of my book? how to get your prospects to convince themselves to buy. Implication, using implication is one of the most powerful tools you can, you can possibly use to get to your prospect's subconscious mind. So again, in your example, you, you can say, I understand that up until moment, up until this moment, they had been on your schedule. You see how we're combining those phrases together? Now, this is not something that's taught in any conventional sales training. This is off. This is not off the shelf. If you're interested on the off the shelf stuff that you, you, everyone has been teaching, I'm not for you. This is unconventional, outside the lines, disconnect the dots. Because I have discovered, because I came into this field from a completely different world, I was not trapped in the assumptions that this field makes. All right, so let's hear the other uh, keys to your sales technique. You, yeah, you said you had five. You said you had five, right? A framework. Well, there's five in, in, in the Invisible Influence series. That's more than I can cover in this, but I'll give you a few. The second thing you want to ask yourself is, before you ask, before you ask yourself, what's my sales presentation going to be? How do I present the the information and blah 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 blah. Understand that the most important thing to ask after you get yourself in the right frame of mind is what frame of mind do I want my prospects to be in before I present the facts, data, figures, information. A lot of agents, when they're going out to get the listing, they present the marketing plan. Look, we've sold these houses in your neighborhood at this price. Look how good we are. Here's our track record. The problem is if you give that data to someone who's unfocused, who's distracted, who's cynical, skeptical, doesn't trust themselves, it's just gonna go in one ear and you're lucky if it goes out the other ear. It'll probably go out with the, 
with what they have. Go <laughs> yeah. from the ear to the butt. So I'm glad you're finding this entertaining. I find when you laugh, the information is going in in a much yeah. level. So well, you just hit my you just hit my uh, fifth grade favorite joke, which was what did one burp say to the other burp? Mm -mm. Let's what? be stinkers and go out the other end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, getting back to my teaching. So ask yourself, the question, ask yourself the question: What state of mind, what frame of mind do I want my prospects in? Now let me back up and give you a metaphor. This is not a trick question. I want to conduct a current of electricity. I have a sheet of gold foil and a sheet of cardboard. It's not a trick question. Which one of those will conduct the electricity? The sheet of gold foil or the sheet of cardboard? Gold foil. Gold foil, exactly. We all know this instinctively. So do we want our prospects in the cardboard states of being distracted, unfocused, overwhelmed, not believing you, and not trusting themselves? No. No. We want them in states of being focused, of trusting themselves, of believing that they're going to make a good decision, even a, a state of childlike suspension of disbelief. So they believe what you say, and even a state where they see you as their leader and they're your followers. Now you can't go in and directly say, uh, Miss Mackey, in a moment, I'm going to give you some hypnotic suggestions. And in these suggestions will include commands you will trust me you will be like a child looking up to a, a trusted leader on the count of three one two three doesn't work like that no. but you can do it with the following bit of language here it goes so and it's going to use what i call implied relationship words implied relationship words are words that suggest imply but don't directly state that you already have a relationship of trust and leadership, etc. So I would say, before we explore our marketing plan together, now let's look at those words. Before we, what does we imply? That we're We've already hired you. Right. Not before I show you. Yeah. Before we explore. Explore is what I call a valuable activity verb. I know I'm dumping a lot here but we go into detail in the Invisible Influence series so you can see it at your own pace and go out and try it bit by bit. Before we explore, what is explore? And for every exploration, there must be a leader. And therefore, for every leader, there must be a what? Follower. Follower, exactly. So right there, that word explore is implying that you're their leader without saying it. Before we explore our, not my or the, our, what does that imply? Our marketing plan. It's going to have input from them. Right. It's a team effort. Right. It's a team effort. Before we explore our marketing plan together, what is together? Together and get, indeed, that's something you're doing as a team. Before we explore our marketing plan together today, I just want to invite. Invite is another implied relationship word. When you're extending an invitation to someone, do you invite someone to something valuable if there's not some exchange going on, an exchange of value? No, you, you would only invite someone to like a celebration or a party or an event. Exactly. Or... So it's doing two things. It's implying a relationship but it's also triggering the law of reciprocity. It's implying that you're giving something of value. And so through the law of reciprocity, they feel that they have to give something of value back to you, which is their time and focus. You're implying all of this very rapidly uh, on the subconscious level. So I just realized that my psychotherapist is using your work on me because he, he always says, Jeff, instead of saying, I need you to reframe that thought, Jeff, I invite you to consider what it would look like <laughs> if you rephrase this. <laughs> That's exactly correct. Yeah. I invite you to consider what it would look like. Mm -hmm. You're extending an invitation. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it works. It never offends me. I'm like, okay. I invite you to imagine what if you were to X. I, I get it. I don't want to get, I do change work too. Very good. 
So I, I just want to invite you to please share the questions, not ask the questions. What's the difference between asking and sharing? That you're going to think about the questions together as opposed to them just waiting for you to respond. Correct. And do we share with people who we don't know or care about? You, I mean, typically, no. Not as no, much as people we really. deal with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just want to invite you to please share the questions that naturally arise. And here comes the kill shot, gentlemen. When a great decision is being made. Now, am I saying who's making the great decision? No, no, collectively, you'll make the great decision, right? Uh, I'm not saying who, when, yeah. about what. I leave it deliberately unclear and confusing. But the subconscious mind, because it wants clarity and hates being confused, will come to the conclusion, based on all the suggestions that you're in something together, we trust that going with you is the right decision. So within the space of the first minute of talking, you put them in that state of absolute trust of wanting to believe you and you've implanted the subconscious suggestion that they can trust their own decisions. You've done it all in the first minute. If all you do is apply that one thing, you'll see your sales go up by 15%. Now that's crazy. It's batshit crazy claim, but guess what? You're not paying me anything yet. So <laughs> what you got to lose? if all I do in this conversation in this education, in this sharing that we're doing, if all I do is entertain and excite you and go, oh, that's interesting, then I've failed. I don't like failing. So as you're listening to this podcast, I encourage you to play it multiple times. When I give the exact words to phrase, say, write them out multiple times by hand, rehearse them so you have them in your back pocket, and just go out and try it. It's going to feel unnatural at first, but so did walking. So did learning to write, but you learn how to do it. So go out and do it. And, and see what happens. Well, I mean, I would invite our listeners to write it down. You and, know, <laughs> I would invite your listeners to ponder. I don't know all the ways in which they might pause and find themselves coming to the joyful conclusion that, yes, this batshit crazy stuff may be the breakthrough from me going from tiny incremental changes to exponential leaps in my sales. But as that's taking place, I'm so glad to know that you have the opportunity to get my Invisible Influence series by texting the word COMPEL, C-O-M-P-E-L, to 411-321. That's 411-321. Or, of course, if you're outside the U.S., you can use WhatsApp and text COMPEL to 1-909-741-1321. That's 1-909-741. 741-1321. Got to throw the plugs in there. I've got cats to feed. <laughs> well, I, I just texted you. And you wrote back already. You're very fast. All right. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so yeah. So, this is very interesting. Uh, and I, I believe it works. Did you say your background is of a hypnotist? I'm trained in Ericksonian hypnosis, neurolinguistic programming. I'm, you're, are you familiar with NLP? Everybody's what is familiar? Ericksonian? No. No. Okay, let's unpack I, I, this. I've been hypnotized. So I'm, I'm, I've I'm, had 30 years, 32 years. I started in 1988. Jesus, that's a long time. Almost 34 years of experience and history doing hypnosis, Ericksonian hypnosis. I'll give a small little side turn here for those who are interested in the topic. So Milton Erickson was a psychiatrist, a medical doctor who in the t- late 20s, early 30s, first started to play with hypnosis. And back then the model was very old, what you would expect hypnosis to be. Go close your eyes, count backwards from 10, visualize a lake. Now you're going to listen to what I say or the kind of thing you see on stage shows today. Erickson, through a unique set of circumstances in his life, found that that didn't work for him. He viewed hypnosis, he revolutionized it and saw it in a completely different way and did what he called conversational hypnosis. So he would tell stories and slide in suggestions and metaphors and he found he could induce trance states and communicate with the subconscious mind without putting people to sleep, although hypnosis never involves sleep. He, in my opinion, and the opinion of many, was to hypnosis what Einstein was to physics or Mozart or Beethoven was to music. 
he's a very brilliant guy. He died in 1980. And so what they did with NLP, the creators of NLP, Richard Bandler, who I interviewed on my podcast, The Influencer's Edge, and John Grinder, a linguist, they looked at people like Erickson and a couple other people, and they extracted out the structure of his talent. What was he doing with his semantics and his linguistics? How he used his voice, his movement, his stories. And they codified it and began to use it to duplicate his results. And they began teaching it through what they call neurolinguistic programming. So I'm highly trained and highly experienced in both. But what really moved me into doing this is again, <laughs> being a daily and charisma, and I'll have to say a pickup coach for lonely guys. I thought, hmm, how can I apply NLP and hypnosis to my own problems? And I got over my own shyness, my own shame. I thought I can make a career, make some good money out of that. And subsequently, my students would come back to me and say, thank you very much. Here's a picture of my wife and my kids. By the way, I've been using your stuff in my sales career and I've, my sales are up 300%. So I would call these guys up and go, well, how the hell are you doing that? And they would explain it to me. I thought, you dumb shit. Of course, this is applicable for sales. You've been doing it in your own online marketing, codify it for salespeople. So I really leapt into it. And I thought, who do I want to do this for? I thought my parents were real realtors. They didn't, they did okay, but they were more interested in being liked than they were in selling, which I'm sure a lot of agents go through. And I thought, first of all, let's do it for the sales world in general. And then let's specialize for real estate agents. And I also like mortgage loan officers are an intricate part of that. So I've worked with people from Loan Depot, you know, Loan Depot, mm -hmm. bless Loan Depot, but these particular people wanted additions to their training. And, and so that's how I came to specialize in it. But hey, if you have a paycheck and you want me to teach you how to do high ticket sales for your coaching program, uh, you can apply to work with me, have a paycheck, have a credit card, I will work. <laughs> so uh, like outside of, so like, uh, I feel like uh, your, these techniques, one, obviously sort of your phrasing um, and, and your, you know, you can kind of walk people down a path uh, for, to make them easier to say yes. And not, like you said, convince themselves to, um, to, to choose you. Um, how about like, is there some similar mental techniques that like say an agent can do for, in their own head that's maybe preventing them from doing the things that they need to be doing, like sending out sure. marketing emails, calling people yeah. like what is self-motivation? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So language is powerful. Language structures, consciousness shapes decisions drives behavior and the metaphors you use to yourself, the stories you tell yourself can control all you think and how you behave. Let's take one example. And my coach, when she watches this, is going to murder lies me. I'll moitalize you because she said, you know what, Paul, you give away so much value. Why would people want to get more? They feel, oh, I've you, that was nice. That was interesting. So don't give away too much, but I'm compelled to do it. Uh, see that word? I snuck in compel. <laughs> As I sit here and I recognize that when I am never. Well, I, I, I think you're playing us, or well, not playing us, but I feel like you're using it on us by, by, by reminding us that you're providing value. Is that a Well, no, actually, I'm doing, I'm telling you the truth. I should not, I should not. It is giving away, no, but I'm going to do well, it. Well, I'm, no, well, I would say the opposite. Like if you were a cookie shop, you would you would stand out front and give away your best cookie to get people inside. You would never give away your third best cookie. To well, I'm going to give away a best cookie. Here it goes. Okay. Here's, okay. here's one of the things. Everyone hates doing cold calls, correct? No one really likes cold calls. But that very metaphor itself implies a couple of things. First of all, is it really cold? Is the phone really 10 degrees Fahrenheit when you pick it up? No. Is there really a layer of ice, a barrier, a block of ice, an iceberg between you and the prospect? Is the prospect really shivering in a refrigerator or a freezer? No. It's a bad metaphor. I'm going to give it to you. Instead of a cold calls, and what's the other thing that's implied in a cold call? When you make a cold call, what's the implication about who's holding the value? Are you holding the value? Or are you trying to get the value from the process? Yeah, you're trying to get the money from them. Exactly. Yeah. So it makes you feel sort of like on some level, no matter how you try to say to yourself, 
I'm going to do it. I love doing cold calling. That metaphor stops you. So here's a better switch. Here's a semantic switch. Technically, it's not semantics, but you guys admit. Here it is. How about if instead you thought of it as opportunity outreaches? How many opportunity outreaches can I extend today? How many opportunities outreaches can I joyously offer up today? Yeah. Now that's completely different. I mean, feel through it. Let's stop talking for a minute. Yeah, I think I like that. So I, the one I came up with was, was thinking about them as warm introductions. Uh, but you said opportunity outreaches. Yes, because when you are giving someone an opportunity, that now implies that you have the value. When you offer someone a gift and they refuse to take it, you're not the one who's being rejected. They're just not in the place where they are able to receive the gift. And if you're coming from a place where you understand you have skills that other people don't, skills to lead people to trust in their own decisions, skills to get people to expand their mind, to include decisions they never knew they deserved to make. Think about this. If it's true, and I believe it is true, that your prospects come to you with all sorts of limiting beliefs about what they deserve, what they can have, et cetera, et cetera, what they can afford, when you expand their consciousness, expand their mind to include new ways of looking at those things, yes, there's two tracks you have to follow with sales, dual tracks. One, you're getting your ideas into their mind using this slick language. On the other hand, you're expanding their mind to include new ideas. So you're expanding their mind. The idea of sales being about expanding consciousness and creating states of consciousness in your prospects is batshit crazy off the wall. And I think I'm gonna claim it. No one's ever thought of it that way before, but it's a very new powerful paradigm to think. So getting back to this point of opportunity outreach, when you talk to yourself and say, this is an opportunity outreach, how many opportunity outreaches can I joyously extend today or offer? Now, all of a sudden, in the back of your mind, in the deep subconscious, you're saying, I'm offering value. I'm not going to get rejected. The worst that's going to happen is there's beautiful value that's left on the table for someone else to grab. It eliminates the fear of rejection, eliminates the resistance to doing it, and actually, it makes it something that you can get some pleasure from each time you pick up the phone and put it down. So Paul, you, you said that the, the two tracks to follow, the first one was getting ideas into people's minds with slow language. The other one was what? Expanding their consciousness to include your ideas. Yeah. When you can sure. take someone who has limiting beliefs about what they deserve, who has confusion around making great decisions and expand their mind, to include those decisions and to have states of clarity, you're doing something heroic. You're changing their narrow little view of the world. Like they're looking, if you've ever been to use a metaphor and I teach the metaphors in a hotel and you look through that little fisheye lens and you see that narrow view of the corridor, you're turning them around and showing them the panoramic view out the balcony of what they can experience. You're expanding their consciousness. You're giving them choices and showing them choices they never knew they could have, which to me is a heroic, even healing thing to do. So the idea of you being a hero doing sales is probably too much to handle, but in a sense, at very least sales, I think in some way for the prospect can be a, a life enhancing experience. It really can if you do it the right way. So a lot of our agents are um, using social media as a, an outreach, as a way to kind of, um, you know, con soft contact uh, folks uh, or at least make a name or a brand for themselves. If they're in a situation where you're not directly communicating one-on-one -on -one in a conversation and can lead them through some of your techniques, um, what are some of the techniques that they could possibly use to kind of plant the same seeds in other people's heads, expand their consciousness, or look at you in a, as someone providing value. Is there any sort of I wonder tips or techniques? Alan, you yeah. can, I wonder if you could like give Paul an example of what a typical real estate post is after someone sells a house to somebody. A typical, yeah, what? A typical Facebook post, for example, about, hey, I sold a house today. You're like, how can, like, what would you think would be, what do you see mostly agents posting? And then how could we, Paul Rossify it. Ha, 
That's a good question. That's never been presented to me before, but I would, what I would do is, is before you say I sold the house, I would say something like, look at what these lucky buyers are enjoying thanks to our work together or something along those lines. Look at what these lucky, our lucky buyers are enjoying thanks to my work with the sellers, uh, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Here's the price, blah, 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 blah. Don't make it about you. I sold this house. No one cares. That's bragging. Don't make it about you. Make it about about something that some other people are enjoying. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Uh, how about someone sharing value? Like, hey guys, the the market's up ten percent, and you know now's the time to buy a house. I'm your I'm your you know reach out to me if you're looking to buy in Atlanta. Ah, that let's put some hypnotic language into it. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it exciting to recognize? Isn't it, or how exciting is it to recognize that the market is up by 15%? Okay. And how exciting is it to recognize that the market is up by 15%? And there's no better time than now to sell your home. Thinking about it like that, reach out to me at. Okay. Do you understand? So, mm -hmm. so, so you're 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 just you're giving them emotions. Like, is this is an yes. exciting? How? Emotion? No. Notice what I said. Is it exciting? I, I didn't say. That. I said, how exciting, which implies it's exciting. Yeah. How exciting is it to recognize, recognize, realize, become aware? imagine it are what we call presuppositions of awareness. It presupposes that it's true. Is it, how exciting is it to recognize that the market is up 15% and there's no better time than now to find yourself selling your home? What are the, those two words, find yourself find and what yourself. are called transphrases? Yeah. What does it mean to find yourself doing something? Let me ask you guys, Jeff. I mean, if, it, it, if I find myself doing something, it, it's authentic to who I am. Yeah, and it implies that it just happened. That or or that it. I learned something about myself, too. And it implies, correct, and it implies that it just happened. You didn't have to struggle doing it. It wasn't even a conscious choice. Have you ever, did you ever just find yourself inside your refrigerator looking around and you don't even remember walking a conscious decision to walk over there yeah i guess i was kind of looking at a different uh because people talk about finding themselves like how do i find myself like how do i understand i mean it in a different way did you yeah, i know yeah that's but i think it could be taken both ways as well i never thought of that thank you you educated me today have you did you ever just find yourself falling in love yeah did you ever just find yourself falling out of love and thinking what the hell was i thinking so <laughs> Find yourself implies a subconscious, out of conscious awareness or control process that's just going to happen. These little tips, language is powerful. If you take one of the tools I teach you, you'll see a nice increase. When you combine three of them together, and this takes skill and frankly, a little coaching, when you can combine three or more of these techniques I've taught at any point throughout the sale, then you begin to see not little incremental results. People settle for too little. They think, how can I improve my sales 5%? That's an incremental increase. If you stick with the sales systems that you know and what you're doing, you'll see incremental increases, but it's the law of diminishing return and your willpower gets exhausted. You have to push harder to see incremental results. If you want to see leaps, if you want to leapfrog over your personal desk, and over the pack, you need to do something unconventional and think in ways you've never thought before. And so that's why I love doing what I do because I love teaching, but I like upsetting the apple cart. I like being disruptive. When I was a little boy, my mother, I was sassing my mom. I'll never forget it. I was six years old and she said, if you don't knock it off, Paul, you're gonna grow up to be an iconoclast. I said, what's that mom? And she said, that's someone who goes around kicking over other people's sacred ideas and idols and really pissing them off and making them angry. I thought, yes, that's fun. Fun. <laughs> mommy, how do I do that? And she just shook her head and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. 
Uh, all right, Paul, uh, what's something that we should have asked you that we haven't asked you yet that uh, to kind of bring it on home here? How can you fall in love with this? How can you fall in love with the power? Of, see, I have an ulterior motive. Yes, I like being of service. I like to make money and I love to communicate and I love to teach. There's a great book called uh, The One Thing by yes. Gary Keller. Keller. Uh, not yes. Keller Williams. Great book. He talks about what is your one thing. My one thing is teaching and speaking and healing and creating things to get people to radically transform how they walk through the world, the world of sales, the world of personal transformation. And my ulterior motive is I want people to fall in love with what I'm in love with, madly and passionately in love with language and its ability to shape our consciousness and therefore shape our world. So I would just say the question I would have people ask is, how can I learn, how can I joyously learn each and every day a little bit more about the power of language to transform my ability to walk through the world in a more powerful way and to fall in love with it, fall in love with the process. And you fall in love with the process by allowing yourself to pause, take a breath and get a little bit of that childhood sense of wonder that something new and amazing has begun. An amazing new journey is begun. And together as we walk that, I hope at least a few of the people listening will choose to walk that path with me, that we'll continue to enjoy ourselves. And it's been my honor to present today. If I, I'll plug one more time, if you'll allow it. <laughs> well, well, I was going to say, um, before you go, like your book. So obviously if someone wants to fall in love with language, like, um, Buy your book, Subtle uh, Ways to Sell. Subtle uh, Words That Sell. Sorry, subtle, subtle Words That Sell, a big difference. Um, but where do you learn? Like, like to me, it's what. what's the next, like, do I learn? Do I follow hypnotists? Do I follow science? Do I learn? Like, yeah, yeah. Where do you learn this, oh, this information? Well, okay. This is a great question. In my life, I've been lucky in a few different ways. I was lucky to have amazing parents. All of my, I like to say that all of my good aspects of who I am came from them. All of my vices are my own. They encouraged me to be an independent thinker, to be an iconoclast, to piss people off and be disrupted with my thinking, not with my actions. So that's happened too in my life. I would say, fine, listen, I am so lucky to have the best teachers my and coaches and trainers. I have four different coaches for my business and I've had great teachers. I learned with Richard Bandler, the co-creator of NLP, an amazing teacher. Uh, a world-class teacher. If all I had was him, I'd be the luckiest human in the world. Then I found my meditation teacher, Shinzen Young, who changed the very nature of how I experienced being human and being, walking through the world. I found my marketing teacher, the guy who taught me how to write copy. For my VI, VIP, extra, extra double diamond clients, I would rewrite your sales copy for you. I'll put hypnotic languaging into your videos and your ads. Uh, that's like double VIP diamond. And Gary taught me years ago, like 1988, when I first got into the business of selling things online. And online wasn't even around back then. We had to advertise in magazines. Gary taught me no one has time to try to figure out your pathetic subtlety <laughs> when it comes <laughs> to marketing. <laughs> but so... I had a great teacher there. I would say find the best teachers you can. Find the very best teachers you can. I, I've been incredibly lucky in, in having a great team as well. Get the right people on your bus. I have, I have the best team. I couldn't, people say, how did you find these people you work with and who work for you? And I say, I don't know. I, I, I cannot believe the blessings I have to have everyone on my team. They're, they're all the best and they're in service to me and they love what they do. Get the right people on your team. Before you figure out, I'd rather take someone who has a good attitude and an aptitude for learning and ambitious than someone who's already really, really good, but gives you crappy attitude and poisons everyone else around them. Get the right people on the bus, get the right people, get the right team members in your life, your spouse, girlfriend, whatever it is, boyfriend, I'm, I don't care what your preferences are. Get the right team because you cannot make it in life without a team, a team to lift you up when you fall and you will fall. 
If you're in business for yourself and the world is screwy and crazy, you'll fall. So have people to pick you up, to support you as much as you can. Support others, but get the best support you can. I, I, I am so lucky to, like, for example, my podcast producer and my team from Interview Connections who gets me on this show. I don't have to worry about any of that. I just get to be the tip of the spear, come out here, do what I'm most privileged to do and what I love doing. So again, find the great teachers, find the great team. I don't know how I've done it. I, I just, have, I know I, how I eliminate bad teachers. I have a trick for that. that I guess that's why I only have good ones because I eliminate the bad ones. With that. How do you recognize the bad ones? I ask them a question that challenges their competence and their ego. My meditation teacher is who's the best teacher I've ever encountered and the most brilliant human being and Einstein in this field. The first day of my first retreat with him, I asked him a question about reconciling yoga and, uh, and Buddhism because there's an apparent, I won't go into the contradiction. And I said, do you understand the contradiction? He said, of course I understand or I wouldn't be qualified to teach. And then he giggled. He said, let's examine what you said. And he began to read as the original Sanskrit. What does this mean? Yoga, Chitta, Vritti, Naroda. Let's translate what that means. And and then he finished and he said, did I answer your question? He giggled again. I said, yes. <laughs> he didn't take it as a personal insult or me. He, he went, okay, I can be a better, I can handle this. And I recall taking a class with a very famous NLP instructor. I challenged him and he personally attacked me and invited me to leave. So if your teacher feels threatened, when you ask a challenging skeptical question and is in reaction mode rather than service mode, get out. When I teach, I want skeptical questions. My work is rigorous. It stands up to scrutiny and the worst that could happen is the best that could happen. It is an opportunity for me to become an even better teacher. Anything that happens to me is only an opportunity and a blessing for me to become a better teacher, which is my ultimate goal in this world. All right. Well, thank you, Paul Ross, author of Subtle Words That Sell. Uh, you've been wonderful, very entertaining. Uh, I'm excited to learn more about this world of language. Uh, I love languages. And uh, yeah, I'm so glad I got books. to join the show on such thank a special you. day. It's been and uh, if I can, one more time, if you want to get my Invisible Influence series and get all of this in more detail, but in bite sized chunks, you can go out and use every day. I love the section on destroying objections. That's my favorite part. There are five sections. Text the word COMPEL to 411-321. 411-321. If you're outside the U.S., which I imagine some of your listeners may be, text the word COMPEL using WhatsApp to 909-741-1321. Make sure to include your best email address because that's how we'll send the goodies out to you. All right. Appreciate it, Paul. Thank you. It really has. Thank you for listening to the Agent Upgrade Podcast. If you are an agent looking for a new mortgage lender, start with Jasmine at jasmineteam.com. If you want to learn about real estate investing and working with investors, check in with Alan at thehouseofac.com. See you next time on Agent Upgrade.